Thanks so many of you for what is becoming a fantastic debate about how us composers get paid. If you haven't checked out that film, I humbly recommend it, linked above and below. But we'll need to move off that subject for now because it is, of course, Now, some of you have commented on the fact that I don't seem to go very deep into each module. For me, this series is about really getting to understand the whole kind of culture of modular synths, uh, to get to grips with the basics of synthesis itself, before kind of diving into creating some music. Because I believe the true test of any piece of music tech is to actually really make music with it. And that is coming soon in a couple of episodes. So this week, we're gonna have a bit of fun and I think we won't get totally there. I think though we are gonna start hinting at the potential of these modular systems and how they do sound intrinsically very different from guitar pedal boards, very different from analog synths. So this week, effects, both of which are from the company Make Noise. First up is the Echophon, which is a pitch shifting echo with smooth time modulation, tempo sync, and saturating feedback, according to their marketing spiel. Next up is their herb verb, which they say is more than just a collection of reverb algorithms or presets. It is a unique, modeless, continuously variable reverb algorithm with complete voltage control. From what I can make out, it's a deeply tweakable reverb unit, and each tweakable knob has its own control voltage input, so you can change it in real time depending on other contingencies. So let's get us back to where we were last week with my own little mini synth being controlled by the Intelligel Metropolis sequencer. And I found a new trick. These little buttons allow you to portamento between steps on the sequencer depending on the glide time set here. All of this stuff is going into the Erica LPF filter and then into our output. Now if I take the out of the filter and put that into the delay unit, hey presto. And this is me altering the pitch of the delays without altering the time. And I believe this goes up or down plus two octaves. And this is me jam syncing the delay time to get it in time with the Metropolis. Here's me fiddling around with the Erica LPF again. Okay, so we can hear the arpeggiator and the delay units aren't in sync unless I manually synchronize them. So I was wondering, Sandy, is there a solution for this? Tempo input on your delay and your reverb from Make Noise there uh, will accept what's called a clock source. Uh, a clock source is a different kind of CD signal, which is essentially a regular stream of triggers or gates uh, describing the tempo that you want. So uh, you could send the tempo information probably from your Metropolis, uh, and that will help that delay lock in to a more sort of rhythmically tight sound, uh, so the time control on your delay will become a uh, subdivision of the tempo that you're sending. Uh, great for, for locking into a sequence. Uh, alternatively, what you could do is send a variable clock source into that, so uh, not a regular click, but something that is speeding up and slowing down, or fluctuating, or ramping up and down, whatever you like. Um, you could probably do that with maths. I'm fairly sure that that thing is able to send out a clock source, and you could use an LFO to vary that clock source as well. Um, changing the tempo during the delay line uh, will probably give you, I don't know with this particular module, but it will probably give you some interesting pitch and timbral results. Uh, if you think about something like a tape delay, uh, when you slow down the speed of the tape, uh, it will change the pitch of the recorded delay and also probably change the color of it, getting darker for slower and, and brighter for faster. Um, so have a little play around with both fixed and variable clock sources in that and just throw some different CV in there and see what happens. I'm sure you'll have some really interesting results with those. Thanks, Sandy. So I'm connecting to the clock of the Metropolis IntelliGel and because I did an RTFM, I've actually put it into the wrong clock out. 
Okay, so how do we achieve that wonderful thing where you get a delay pedal to feed back on itself? Well, as with all modular stuff, you have to connect a patch lead from the feedback out and back into the echo font. Now I'm following Sandy's advice and I'm getting a low frequency oscillator to change the amount of feedback mix I have from the echo font over again quite a long period of time. But as you can see I still haven't clocked that it isn't really synchronizing to the Metropolis so I alter it again and jam sync it by hand. I'm absolutely loving this effect. This is the world I want to live in. Well, that's another kind of punch the air moment for my modular experience. Sandy, how is your DIY project getting on? So this week I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, DIY electronics, uh, where I'm sourcing some of the information that I'm using and where it might be a good idea to start. So if you're brand new to uh, DIY electronics or soldering, then this project is not the sort of place to start. Uh, you probably want to go to thonk.co.uk if you're in the UK. Modularaddict.com is a great place in the US for finding kits. And uh, these will be complete DIY kits with the PCB, all of the materials, all of the components included, clear instructions and usually a faceplate as well. Although it's always worth checking the kit has the faceplate and all the components, some of them are just PCB only. So if you're, if you're brand new to DIY projects, those are a great place to start. You can find some really interesting modules. So a good place to start would be with the Turing machine, which is a great place to learn how to solder and you end up with a really useful module at the end of the day. However, I'm not starting with simple kits. I'm going to be doing these uh, DIY projects from the ground up and try and teach myself a little bit along the way. First off, you'll need your PCB. Uh, this one I ordered from a company online, but if you get the schematics from Mutable Instruments GitHub, link in the description below, uh, you can get these things fabricated yourself. It's just probably be a little bit more time consuming and potentially more costly. So you'll need your PCBs. Your components will come from the bill of materials, also from the GitHub, linked in the description below. That is essentially just a list of components uh, with their corresponding uh, where they go on the board, so your R5, C10, IC10, uh, you know, those will be listed and it'll tell you what component that is. And uh, in, the, in the Mutable Instruments Bill of Materials, it gives you a mouser part number. Um, that's a part number that you can put into mouser.com and it will give you the listing where you can order it. I've ordered from three different companies. Uh, here in the US, I've ordered from Mouser, Arrow and DigiKey. Uh, those are all probably the three biggest. Um, there's also companies like SparkFun, in the UK, you've got Farnell uh, as another one I've ordered from previously. Um, but basically, as long as you make sure you have all of the parts that are on the bill of materials um, and you have a PCB, uh, you're pretty much good to start. So a couple of the things that you're going to need for a surface mount soldering project like this is obviously a soldering iron. In this case, I've replaced the tip on my soldering iron with a finer one. Uh, this is one of the reasons I went with the Hako iron. Uh, other companies like Weller also have replaceable tips. Um, this just has a whole host of different tips you can use. Uh, I've gone for like a half millimeter, it's very, very fine. Any smaller than that, and I would be worried that it wouldn't transfer heat very well. Um, so this is probably still quite big for the, for the size of electronics I'm gonna be soldering. Um, but there are ways of getting around that. You'll also need flux. This is a flux pen. It's, it helps stop some of the oxidization process when you're soldering, and somehow that helps with the uh, surface tension of the components and their, uh, the solder. I don't really know exactly how, it's a sort of a magic sauce that you can put on to help with your soldering and um, make sure things flow properly when you're heating them up. You'll also need finer solder for a surface mount soldering project. So this is the sort of solder that I would pick up at the hardware store. So the regular stuff is great for through hole soldering, but it's pretty much useless for surface mount because you'll just end up with far too much solder on the board. You'll end up bridging contacts on your circuits and so on. In contrast, the very, very small stuff is pretty much useless for through hole because it's so fine that you just honestly can't feed it quick enough when you're, when you're soldering with it. But it's great when you want to have very, very fine control over the amount of solder ending up on the board. Finer tips, finer solder, plenty of flux and finally a pair of tweezers comes in very handy. Some of these components, for instance the IC that I'm going to be soldering this week, those are about the size of five pence piece or the fingernail on your pinky and have something like 64 legs. They're very very fragile and I have big sausage fingers. 
So something like this will help you pick up those components and place them, make sure they're oriented correctly without damaging the components. Uh, so I'm going to get started on this soldering. And probably, like I say, it's going to take me a few days just to get these ICs soldered because uh, I just want to take my time and be very, very methodical about this. Uh, but I'll give you an update as and when I get on with those. Well, thanks again, Sandy. And because I am a tart of the highest order, I couldn't stop at the delay. I had to move into the stereo domain. And how do we do that? Well, we do that with reverb. Finally reconnected to the Metropolis clock out, not clock in, I've now patched that across to the reverb in, and now I've connected a left and a right out into the stereo output of the rack. And hey presto, we're in the land of stereo once more. So here's all sorts of knobs that I'm going to have a laugh with. This one is size, clearly alters the length of the uh, reverb decay. We've also got our mix and then all sorts of other funny, strange things that I'm going to experiment with in the forthcoming weeks. And as I said before, each has its control voltage input. And this is where we start touching on what fascinates me about modular synthesis is pretty much anything can control anything else. So we will be entering into the world of chaos and contingency soon. This is me turning the tempo of the Metropolis down, and you'll hear that the Echophon is staying in sync with that. So then we lift the mix back to give us a very respectable synth, delay and reverb. Truly splendid. And thanks also to you guys for the recommendations regarding distortion. I feel from listening to the echo and the reverb this week that I'm very much going to need to EQ the sound and wondered, I know that there are some modular EQ units available and wondered if you had any suggestions for that. Next week I'm hoping to get a little bit more freaky and it's my ambition to actually create a piece of music along the lines of what my ambition is for Fergal, my Frankenstein. So hopefully this whole kind of odyssey becomes a bit clearer to you. Thanks as always for watching. If you haven't subscribed, please hit subscribe. More modules to go in yet. And if you like what I do, hit like. Want to be notified, ring that bell. See you next week.